Okay, let's get started. Um, so this month we're gonna take a look at embedded programming on these little single board c computers, SBCs, um, that are popular in the maker community. Uh, we're gonna start out looking at the Arduino Uno and this board is an, a piece of open source hardware which means that the hardware design, the schematics are available under an open source license and anyone can produce boards according to that schematic and make compatible products. So anybody could make an Arduino board. The original board came out of a group in Italy. You can read the history of Arduino Uno on Wikipedia. Uh, and they created it to make it easy to create projects that incorporate sensors and actuators. And we'll go into what that means in a second. Um, largely for an audience that was not, uh, it's not that they weren't computer friendly, they weren't knowledgeable about programming. They're not software engineers, they're not electrical engineers, they're artist type uh, persons that are creating installations maybe for themselves or they got their own little projects or um, what now we would call the maker community people that make stuff but isn't necessarily uh, the programming and circuit design it's not necessarily like their day job so they needed to lower the barrier to entry for experimentation with uh, sensors and actuators and also, they needed to lower the barrier to programming. The uh, Generally, it's a microcontroller-based system. The Arduino Uno is a, basically a microcontroller on a board. We'll look at the details of the Uno in a second. And usually, these boards are programmed you know, with a C compiler and a cross-compiling tool chain. And you have to download that tool chain and install it on your machine. And then you have to go through some kind of build process to get a file that you can then upload into the device and then run it on the device and then if you want to hook up a debugger then it's even more difficult because now you have to set up debugging support in the target machine and connect that up to the tool chain on the host so that's a lot of complicated stuff to expect somebody who just wants to make, say, a uh, their own ki kind of Hello Kitty statue that's a cat waving its arm. Uh, that That's a lot to ask for somebody that's just trying to make a project that's simple, but all of these technology pieces that are required to realize that project are complicated. So what they did was they made this open source hardware board so that gave everybody a uniform hardware platform and this hardware platform is extensible and you can connect sensors and actuators to that platform so I mentioned we'd say what sensors and actuators are sensors are it's pretty straightforward anything that receives some kind of input from the real world senses it and turns that into some kind of signal which you can then inject into your system and read on the hardware that may be an analog signal that you send into an analog to digital converter it may be a simple on off like a switch uh, an example of a analog signal would be obviously a microphone it is giving you an analog voltage that represents the sound that it's picking up so uh, sensors come in a wide variety of electrical interfaces so you're going to need some kind of flexible hardware to be able to reach a, a wide spectrum of sensors and an actuator is the reverse it's anything that receives some kind of instruction from the computer to interact with the real world uh, as the simplest kind of actuator that you can think of is simply an LED you give it a signal and it either turns on or off so this is interacting with the real world by you know sending light into the environment and that now that LEDs are 
multicolored and have continuous color um, intensities. That can give you very elaborate projects just by interfacing with modern LEDs. But it can also be things like a piezoelectric buzzer or a screen, an LCD screen or an LED screen. It could be uh, an LED character display or an LCD character display. It could be a motor. It could be a signal to a relay that triggers a uh, high current device like turning on and off a incandescent light or turning on and off an external motor or some kind of external device. So to simplify all that, they made their open source hardware platform, which their first one was called the Arduino Uno. They've since come out with subsequent Arduino boards. We're not going to talk about all of them. There's a bunch. You can, again, you can read about those on Wikipedia. It is also inspired, the success of the Uno is also expired, inspired other single board computers to be created, of which there are many. There are thousands now of different processor architectures, different combinations of peripherals and so on. Um, in the next two months we'll be talking about the Raspberry Pi Pico which is a very recent entry and we'll also talk about the Raspberry Pi 4 uh, and the Raspberry Pi is another popular platform that's been around for a number of years. So what's different about embedded development versus development of uh, C++ code in an ordinary situation. Maybe you're making a console application or a GUI application. Well, one of the first things that's different is the standard library is usually a very small restricted subset of what you're used to. For instance, it's very common for there not to be any form of standard I.O because these single board computers may not have any attached console to which they can print text. It's very common for them to have a serial port which is uh, usually interfaced to another computer over USB but even having a serial port is not guaranteed. There are plenty of microcontrollers that don't have any um, built-in kind of console environment. Um, they may have serial ports, but those serial ports are not assumed to be the console. They could be used for anything. So that's one big difference. The other big difference is that there's no operating system. So just like the standard library facilities are missing, there's nothing like cooperative multitasking. There's no um, device abstraction from an operating system per se. Um, the more co complicated single board computers have uh, hardware APIs or, or APIs available for you to access the hardware provided as libraries. But typically the things you're used to say from accessing you know files as or devices as files under Unix or accessing devices through um, well in Unix it would be an IOCTL call in Windows it would be a device IO call these are facilities provided by those operating systems to allow you to supply commands directly to a device these things are missing there's also no virtual memory address protection so normally if you have a program that accesses an address that uh, through a pointer that's filled with junk you'll get a trap by the operating system and a core dump will be generated it'll register as a seg fault on Unix and it'll register as um, a, an access error on Windows I'm trying to remember the exact name I, is, I'm drawing a blank at the moment but the virtual memory subsystem would catch that on a operating system that supplies virtual memory but in a microcontroller you don't have virtual memory so what happens is just whatever you read through a junk pointer you just 
when it, the, the hardware responds however it responds. It may, if you're lucky, something will indicate that you performed an illegal operation, but most of the time you can't tell the difference between a valid memory address read and an invalid memory address read. So, virtualization of a process memory space, that's all missing. On the plus side, none of those things are in your way. So these are not supercomputer CPUs. These are CPUs with a limited amount of power and a limited amount of computation capacity. And if you have a, um, a bit of work to do, you don't want anything else running to get in your way, especially if you have to respond to sensors in a timely fashion. So it's, it's very different working on these embedded computers, but not so different from a development process point of view when we'll see when we look at the IDE. So let's take a look briefly at the Arduino IDE. So uh, I'm sorry, I can't really make the font size larger or can increase the contrast of this. The Arduino IDE just uh, fixes those things by itself and I don't have any way to change it. So if you can't read the text, um, you'll have to, you know, drill in on the video later. But this uh, is this is a what's called the blink sample. So one of the first things people do with these single board computers to show that they can get a program running on the computer and get it uh, compiled, get it uploaded, and get it running is they the one of the first things everybody does is just try to make an LED blink on and off. Um, and this brings us to one of the other main differences that I didn't mention yet between embedded programming and regular programming is that in embedded programming there is a main function that is called just like in ordinary C++ to initiate your code but your main function should never exit so typically the main function is an infinite loop and the reason it should never exit is because if it exits then the system stops responding and there's nowhere to exit to if you return from main, where is it supposed to go? What is the single board computer supposed to do? It, it doesn't have any outside environment for you to return to from executing your main function. So typically your main function is an infinite loop. And here the loop is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> There's a, in, in this uh, sample, there's a setup function and there's a loop function. And the loop function is what will be executed in an infinite loop by the main function. And the setup function will be invoked once and then the loop function is called repeatedly forever. So in this example, the setup function does something called pin mode and it, its first argument is LED built in and the second argument is output and the comment is telling us that it initializes the digital pin called LED built in as an output pin. And in a second we're going to talk about uh, hardware details so you'll understand more about like what does it mean for a pin to be an input or an output. And then when we get into this repeated loop it's going to do digital write of a high to the LED built in then it's going to do delay 1000, so that's 1000 milliseconds, so it'll delay for one second. Then it'll write to the LED built-in pin a low, and then delay for another second. And I've got... You guys sh should be able to see a little inset camera image of my... Arduino board running the blink sample and you can see there's one LED on the main board that's blinking on and off. We can, uh, let's go full screen on that. So you can see there that there's one big chip on the blue board, that's the microcontroller, 
it's got a USB connection which is how I'm connecting it to my PC and there's a little LED on there that's blinking on and off and there are some connectors on either side of the board and I've got a bunch of wires uh, connected to a uh, circuit prototyping area on the left which we'll look at later but right now it's not doing anything so let's get back to this the Arduino IDE has created a programming and abstraction where there's a function that's called one time the setup function and that configures the hardware for whatever you're gonna do in your main loop and then in your main loop you run forever doing whatever it is that's of interest to you now in a small single board computer with sensors and actuators usually your main loop goes like this look at the sensors to see what's changed do whatever action you're supposed to take by taking the changed inputs turning them into some kind of internal state that represents what your uh, little single board computer is supposed to be doing and then update the actuators based on the changes to your internal state now in this case I'm not really keeping any internal state my sensors are non-existent I'm not paying attention to any inputs at all and my actuators are this single LED the built-in LED and I'm just sending a high and a low to that LED repeatedly with a one second delay after each change now just to prove to you that that this is really running from my computer we can change this let's change the the high to be on for two seconds and the low to be on for half a second and if I go up here to the sketch menu and I say upload it's again kind of low contrast but down here on the bottom it says compiling sketch and we can see let me make this a little bigger we can see that it it ran the compiler and compiled the sketch there were no compile errors it uploaded it to the computer the little single board computer so we make this full screen again and now we can see that that LED is it's on for two seconds and it's off for half a second so this IDE simplified my programming model I didn't need to figure out how does this computer when it resets how does it get into my code what is all the stuff surrounding the main function and how does the main function do what it's gonna do the Arduino simplifies that by saying the main function always does this it calls setup and then it calls loop in an infinite while loop and although that's what the main function looks like the specifics of how a program gets launched on any single board computer are different based on the microcontroller and the hardware design that's being used so in this particular case the Arduino Uno has a, a USB serial port that is how the compiled code gets uploaded from the host computer onto the Arduino Uno, Arduino Uno board and then that can change the code that's being executed and as soon as that code is uploaded then the, the microcontroller is now running the new code there is the additional question of what happens after I remove power and apply power again so does um, you know does the single board computer does it retain the code that you've uploaded or do you have to upload it every time you apply power we could do that as a quick experiment because this is powered by USB so I can unplug the power and plug this back in and it's still running the previous program that I loaded in um, in Arduino the programs are called sketches so one of the nice things about Arduino is that 
it comes with a large number of built-in examples that are set up for the Arduino board. Now, obviously, just changing the program that's running on the board doesn't change the hardware. So if you're running a sketch that is trying to convert an analog signal into a digital signal and then do something with that, obviously, you have to hook up some kind of analog sensor to the appropriate port on the board that has an analog to digital converter attached to it. So how do you know what hardware is available to you? Well, let's get this off the screen. And the way you know that is you need to look at the technical documentation for your hardware. Now there's technical documentation for the UNO itself. Um, and this is a because my little webcam is kind of crappy, so this is better to see the components on the board. This big chip is the microcontroller, and you'll notice that uh, on the board they've labeled all these uh, individual pins on these two ports that are on either side of the board. Uh, the terminology for this kind of port is called a header, and you'll notice over here that there's uh, the digital pins are labeled you know 13 digital 13 digital 12 11 10 etc and over here are the analog input pins a0 through a5 and there's also some pins over here labeled for uh, power so in in my case let's go back to this in my case I'm using this little combination of a little breadboard prototyping area and the UNO board that was sold by SparkFun that's called it they call it the SparkFun Inventors Kit but you can get these kinds of boards from you know, pretty much anybody and if you want to be even more low budget you can just buy the little breadboard and the UNO board separately maybe save save yourself a few dollars but um, and then I've used these wires to connect my little circuit on the right to the Uno. Now I've got I've got this red wire disconnected, so my prototyping area is currently not powered. But um, this is basically how you prototype your system in Arduino. Is you typically use a breadboard. You could use any kind of circuit construction technique to get your sensors connected to the Arduino through these headers. Let's go back to the document. So these headers are what you're going to use to connect to the outside world. Uh, there's a barrel jack here to supply power because once your project is finished you're typically not going to have it attached to a computer. It's going to be in some kind of installation or it may be you know uh, measuring humidity in your backyard. It's not attached to a computer so it wouldn't be attached through the USB port to get power it'd be attached to this barrel jack. People typically do things like use a uh, lithium battery or just plain old you know NICAD uh, battery cells, a battery pack. Um, there's also a little push button on here so you can use that as a, a guaranteed input on the Arduino. Uh, the push button um, this might be dedicated, it says reset right here. I can't remember if it's dedicated to reset or if you can repurpose it to whatever you want. Um, but having a reset button on there is handy if, you're, if your sketch goes crazy and you need to, uh, you're not sure what's happening, you need to reset the board and get it started running again, you can use the reset button. Um, this little surface mount chip here is the USB interface and the more interesting thing happens with you know what we can do with these headers now since Arduino is an open source hardware platform one of the things that people started doing was making little uh, daughter boards that connected into these headers on either side so that you could have a, a ready-made circuit that accomplished a particular thing and you just plug it into the Arduino and then you're ready to go and you don't have to design the circuit yourself and connect it yourself and this is very common with uh, LCD display boards, for instance. The LCD display is mounted on a little circuit board with 
whatever interface circuitry is needed and then it has pins that extend from the bottom and they plug into these headers on top of the Arduino and that combination of a circuit board that connects into the Arduino is called a shield there's a big ecosystem of shields you can find shields for many many different applications from robotics oriented shields that have motor drivers that can drive motors the uh, you know wheels on your little scooter for instance or um, if uh, you want to drive a display there are many display shields uh, there, there's shields of of many different varieties but the thing that you will end up needing to know is what are the pinouts of these um, pins that are or these headers that are on there and let's see I thought I had that here hold on a second Uh, it, it's documented. I just I just don't have the document handy. Um, now, sure, that tells you about the Arduino board itself, but there's a lot of resources inside the microcontroller. So the next thing you want to look at is what's called a data sheet for the microcontroller. Here's the data sheet from Microchip. They're the manufacturer that produces the microcontroller which is in on the Arduino Uno it's an 18 mega 328 so it's a 328 <coughs> excuse me and you know this data sheet it's it's 653 pages long do you need to read the whole thing no but one of the things that you find out here is in the microcontroller here let me make this bigger in the microcontroller it has peripherals built into the microcontroller so it's got two 8-bit timer counters uh, with prescalers and compare mode so um, a timer is basically a circuit that has a numeric value and it will either count up or count down and then it can initiate an event when the count gets to a certain value usually this is you load it with a positive value and the counter counts down and then it issues in a, a hardware alert. I'm being a little bit vague in my terminology. We'll get to the specifics of this in a second. It'll issue a hardware alert when the counter counts down to zero. The prescaler lets you increase the range of the counter by uh, switching the number of ticks of the input that cause the counter to decrement and what I mean or, or the counter to count and so what I mean by that is if your prescaler is set to one then whatever is the the input that is causing the, the timer to tick to count up or count down it'll be one to one with the input but if your prescaler is set to eight then it has to get eight ticks on the input before the counter will uh, count up or count down uh, I'll just say countdown from now on because that's the typical case. Uh, so, you know, an 8-bit timer, that's only 256 values, right? So if if it's measured off a microprocessor clock and the microprocessor clock is 16 megahertz, so that's 16 million times a second the clock is changing state. That means if your counter was only 8 bits, it would have a hard time reacting to long event to a long count or a long amount of time right because it, it can only count 256 ticks before it runs out of space so the prescaler is pretty important for a an 8-bit counter and even for a 16-bit counter right a 16-bit counter if our if it's being toggled or, or uh, ticked by the system clock and the system clock is 16 megahertz well that still means this counter is counting all the way down to zero one million times a second so again the prescaler is very common with a timer because it allows you to measure longer periods of time um, 
it also has uh, a real-time counter with a separate oscillator so I'd have to I honestly would have to dig into the details of this data sheet to see what what makes this different from the these other two timers up here these, these are kind of standard things they're calling this a real-time counter so I'm not sure what makes that separate but that would all be explained in here uh, my goal is to give you an overview of this stuff, not explain in detail everything that's in here because, you know, it's a 700 page document. So, um, a PWM channel, so that's pulse width modulation, and that's an output. And the idea is suppose you needed to produce a analog voltage that was about halfway between your um, power supply and ground. Well, one of the things that the the Mega 328 or any of these are 18 mega chips, and therefore all the Arduino boards, they don't they have analog to digital converters, but they don't have digital to analog converters. So when people need an analog voltage that is you know within some range, some some uh, variable voltage range, not necessarily a digital on or a digital off. They'll use pulse width modulation, which works fine for analog outputs that are, or or a analog inputs to us to an actuator where the the analog input does not have to be changing very rapidly. So basically, pulse width modulation. The idea is you keep the digital output on for a certain amount of time, and then you keep it off for a certain amount of time. And the ratio of on to off is called the duty cycle. So if it's at 100% duty cycle, that means it's always on and never off. And if it's at 0% duty cycle, it's always off and never on. And as the digital voltage toggles between on and off, depending on the ratio of the duty cycle, when you average that out, you can get an analog voltage that's somewhere between the power supply and ground. So it's a way to get a variable analog output as long as whatever is that analog output is feeding is not sensitive to um, the instantaneous voltage and is only sensitive to the average voltage. <coughs> Excuse me. So PWM is useful for analog outputs that vary. Uh, it has 10-bit analog to digital converters it has a 6-bit or sorry it has another um, it, it depending on the package of the microcontroller in our case the Arduino Uno board uses a dual inline package this plastic dip package is what it's called so it's got six channels of 10-bit analog to digital conversion and one of those channels is dedicated to temperature measurements. So that's basically measuring the temperature of the microcontroller itself because it has an operating range. If it gets too hot or it gets too cold, the chip is not guaranteed to function correctly. So you can actually measure that with code to find out if the chip is running too hot and then maybe adjust your computation, do less work, or maybe even completely turn itself off or if it's too cold, etc. It has a uh, programmable serial USART. So USART is a universal synchronous asynchronous receiver transmitter. It's a serial port. Uh, it also has uh, an SPI serial interface. So when it, as you start looking at sensors and actuators, modern sensors and actuators usually have some kind of intelligence built into them already. And that intelligence is exposed through either the SPI interface or the I squared C interface. These are just serial interfaces where the specification of the serial communication is fixed and it allows the sensor or the actuator to communicate with the microcontroller at a higher level. So typically you're sending commands to an actuator, you're um, to cause it to change behavior and you're sending commands to a sensor to request uh, 
uh, sensor readings from the sensor. Um, it also has a watchdog timer. So this uh, I squared C serial interface is the other kind of uh, common interface for connecting sensors and actuators to a microcontroller. Uh, a watchdog timer. If you haven't done embedded programming before, you might not be familiar with a watchdog timer. A watchdog timer, its whole purpose is it counts down, and if it counts all the way down to zero, then it resets the whole system. So it acts as a watchdog to make sure that the system is always responsive. And typically what you do in your main loop, in your infinite while loop, is after you do your application code in one pass of the loop, the next thing you do is reset the watchdog timer so that it doesn't count all the way down to zero. And this is another thing that the Arduino programming abstraction handles for you. Uh, there's an analog comparator, so I mentioned that there's no analog to digital converter, but there is a comparator, so you can take an arbitrary analog input and you can compare it to another analog voltage and find out if the input is bigger or less than your reference. And that can be useful for things like if you have an external temperature sensor that's calibrated, but it doesn't talk over a digital interface like I squared C or SPI, it just talks as an analog voltage. And you need to know something when that temperature being measured by that sensor uh, goes above or below a limit, which would be corresponding to above or below a voltage reference that represents the, the two limits. Um, so that analog comparator can, can be useful for a, a bunch of things. Um, interrupt and wake up. We'll, we'll get to interrupts in a little bit. Uh, wake up is basically the ability to operate in a low power state until something happens that's interesting. And then the microcontroller can wake up and begin executing your main loop again. Um, just keep going on here. Uh, there are 23 programmable I.O. lines. So these are digital I.O.s. Um, let's see if I can get this highlighted nicely. There you go. Digital I.O.s, some of which are going to be used by the Arduino board itself. For instance, uh, one of those input lines is attached to that button. And as we saw with our little blinking LED, one of those outputs is attached to the built-in LED on the board. So quite a variety of peripherals that are built into the Arduino itself. Now, as you drill down in this manual, let's see if we can find an example here. As you go through this manual, I I'm, don't have a particular place bookmarked at the moment, but you can find it yourself. What you find is that all these peripheral devices, how do you control them from code? Well, there's going to be portions of the address space that are mapped to the control registers that represent all of these peripherals. So reading from a magic memory location and the specific address of that location is documented in the data sheet for the microcontroller. Reading from that magic memory location might return the value of one of the digital input pins or it might return to you the result of an analog to digital conversion on one of the analog input pins. Similarly writing to one of those control registers might result in a digital output being presented on the circuit or um, it might control the timer period for one of the timers or how the timer responds when it counts all the way down. For instance, does it just set a flag or does it set an interrupt? Does it cause an interrupt to happen? If it causes an interrupt to happen, then there has to be a piece of code called the interrupt handler that's associated with that interrupt. 
and that code may or may not be called depending on whether or not the interrupts are enabled which is again controlled by another control register that would control the interrupt behavior for that particular timer so there's a lot of these registers mapped into the address space of your code and this is another difference between writing regular desktop oriented code and code on an embedded system is that again there's no virtual memory protection preventing you from writing bad things into control registers that cause your system to go haywire everything is available to you for for better or worse it's usually for the better and we'll see why in a second so as you can imagine there's all these peripherals each of these peripherals has multiple registers that correspond to control inputs as well as inputs and out data inputs and outputs for each peripheral so there's a lot of these registers there's a bunch of these peripherals they have each one has multiple registers that can um, control its behavior and the registers themselves have funny behavior like some of them are write only you can write a value into the register but attempting to read from it is not possible due to the way the circuitry is arranged or it may be a read only register that you can read from but you can't change its value by writing to it and there the individual control inputs are usually packed into bit fields within these individual registers um, the word size of the AT Mega 328 is 8-bit so it's it's it has a 16-bit address space but it has 8-bit words so it operates on bytes so these control registers you know they're they're packed into a sequence of bytes and the individual bits mean different things and keeping all that straight is annoying so how does Arduino solve that well what we saw here in Arduino is that we called a function called pin mode in the setup and the first argument was a pin number and I don't think it will yes it's it's this isn't like Visual Studio so I can't just arbitrarily drill in to find out what the value of this LED built-in is but um, it's predefined in the Arduino IDE and so we're calling pin mode with a pin number and then we're changing its mode to output and both LED built-in output and pin mode these are all declared in a library file that Arduino automatically includes and in fact let's see so if we go over here and look at I, I just googled Arduino library and we've got their documentation up for the library that they provide and I think we can go over here to functions and we can go to pin mode and it says it configures the specified pin to behave either as an input or an output and the digital pins page describes the particular behavior of pins as the when they're configured as inputs or or outputs so the way that the Arduino simplifies all these memory mapped registers that are controlling all the little bitty details of how all these uh, peripheral units work is they have abstracted that into a library with a series of functions so this language reference page is a good overview of the kinds of um, stock functions that are available on Arduino to control the onboard peripherals shall we say these are the peripherals that are either directly on the microcontroller or a facility of the Arduino board itself so you'll notice that there's functions here for the analog IO uh, the an, an analog write as I mentioned is done with a, a PWM wave let's see the, how their description compares to mine so here they're showing the duty cycle how the actual voltage if you put it on an oscilloscope would be 
toggling between the power supply and ground, but if you put a uh, something like a voltmeter on there, a voltmeter or a digital multimeter just reg registering an analog voltage, measuring an analog voltage, it's going to average that out over the duty cycle. And it's going it's to show you not oscillating between 5 and 0. It's doing this millions of times a second. It's going to show you the average value. So it'll be like you know 3.45 or whatever it is that corresponds to the duty cycle. So uh, we've got analog I.O. Um, more advanced I.O. functions. Uh, ability to manipulate time. Uh, now, why do they list the math functions here? Because as I mentioned, in an embedded environment, you don't have access to the standard library, so you can't assume that you can call a function like cos um, for cosine. Now, they provide an implementation of cosine, but when you drill into the data sheet for this microcontroller, you'll find out it doesn't have a dedicated floating point unit. So to perform floating point computation, that actually has to be uh, done in software. Even to take two floating point numbers and add them, instead of that being a single instruction in the instruction set of the microcontroller, you jump to a software routine that takes the two floating point values and adds them through a software algorithm using integer mathematics. So integer add is on the CPU as a native built-in instruction, but floating point is not. So if you want to add two floating point numbers together, then you have to do that with a little subroutine. Now, you notice there's no add function in here, and that's because they've hooked in the floating point support into the compiler. So when you write, you know, f equals x plus y, and they're all floating point values, the compiler turns that into function calls to the appropriate subroutines to do the floating point add for operator plus. It's, you can think of it as like in C++, you can take a class and write your own operator plus and define what plus means for your data type. The compiler does the same thing for a float. The data type has to be emulated in the native instruction set because the native instruction set only has integer operation, operations. So if you want to do floating point operations, you have to do that by writing your own routine for add and so on. Now they do that for the built-in operators and then supply a limited amount of functions for doing uh, standard math operations. Uh, again, because you don't have access to the standard library here. Um, and then some character manipulation, operations of random number generator, some, some bit manipulation, the ability to attach your own code as the interrupt handler, um, the ability to control whether interrupts are happening or not, and the ability to communicate over the serial port. Now, what gets interesting is when you look at how they've done the serial port. So, in Arduino land, what they've done, you notice that it says serial dot read. So instead of calling a function, it's calling a method on an object. And if we go down here, they don't quite say, but basically, let's see if this will show. Notice that in their little example codes, there's they're not showing any pound includes, and that's because the library that we're looking at the documentation for now. This is the built-in library of stuff that's available on Arduino. So everything that's here, you don't need to include any include files to access it. it it's always available. And the way they've done the serial port support is there's basically a global object called serial. <coughs> Excuse me. There's basically a global object called serial, and you're really just calling methods on that object. And that serial port represent that that object represents a single serial port. So what they've done is they took the GCC open source compiler, 
they've configured and built that compiler to target the hardware architecture of the AT Mega 328. They've supplied their own startup code that surrounds main. So this is the code that is executed when the CPU is reset that bootstraps the system into running. They simplified the programming model with a one-time setup function and a main function that you call that's called repeatedly in your loop. They've simplified access to the onboard peripherals by providing a built-in library that's always available that gives you functions you can call to control them at a higher level rather than having to directly manipulate the memory mapped registers. So what about when you buy one of these third-party shields or you buy your own sensor and then you connect that up to the Arduino? How do you maintain that high level of abstraction of working with the hardware? And the answer is that there are many third-party libraries and uh, these libraries cover sometimes they cover multiple sensors of the same variety for instance multiple temperature sensors that have a similar interface will be accessed by a single library it's also very common for a particular piece of hardware that you might get from say Adafruit or SparkFun both of which are two common places for makers to get pre-assembled uh, you know little little tiny circuit boards that will have a sensor and, and an interface on it to make it easy to consume that sensor. They'll supply libraries that you can plug into the Arduino IDE so that you can access those hardware resources by including a header that gives you access to the definitions or get, sorry gives you access to the declarations and then there's a library that's linked against your code to resolve uh, any functions that you call that need to be resolved against their definitions. So they simplified all of that stuff and just to show you an example of another sketch. So here now let me let me go back over here and show you on this circuit board so it's kind of let me see if I can show it to you there's little IC chip under here and that is a 74 138 chip and you might be saying I don't know I don't know what that is and this is what it is so a 138 is a decoder And if we look at this diagram of the pins on the package, there are three digital inputs here that are labeled A, B, and C. This is the select. And then there's three inputs here labeled as enable. And then uh, there's one output on this side of the chip, and the remaining outputs are on the other side of the chip. And what this chip does if we look at the uh, function table for this chip we can see that assuming that the enable pins are configured to enable the chip so when the chip is disabled it doesn't do anything it doesn't these X's mean don't care on the inputs so when the chip is disabled it doesn't matter what's on the inputs the outputs are always high so the chip is it when it's disabled it basically always is outputting ones on all the outputs but the more interesting case is when the chip is enabled and then we see we have the eight different combinations of the three inputs and what they do is each of the eight combinations turns on one of the eight outputs the outputs are so-called active low so turning it on means putting a low on the output so this is called a 3 to 8 decoder so it takes a 3-bit binary number decodes it into turning on one of eight digital outputs and this kind of rat's nest of wires here that I've got on my circuit board 
is connecting up the inputs and the outputs. Well, it's connecting the inputs up to the Arduino. These three blue wires are the inputs. The outputs are going to a group of LEDs that I've got up here. So I've got eight LEDs. And if I power this up by connecting power from the Arduino. Okay. Initially, it's just driving all the LEDs uh, because it's disabled. So remember, the outputs of this chip are high when the, when the uh, chip is disabled. And since it's disabled, it's turning on all of the LEDs. But if I go, let me show you my code again. So my sketch that I wrote here is I am uh, I'm configuring all the pins on my, my, three, my three inputs. I'm configuring the three inputs as output pins. And then this is just a little helper function that I wrote to um, convert my uh, counter here to the, the appropriate uh, values for the pins. And so as we go through this, I'm going to write my 3-bit binary value for each iteration of this loop. I'm going to write that as three digital write calls to the three input pins of this 3 to 8 decoder. And then I'm going to delay for a quarter second. I'll do that for each of the um, values of 0 through 7 that the decoder can accept as input. And uh, after I do the seventh one, we will have delayed for a quarter second, and then this whole loop will get called again, and it'll just go and cycle through it again. So as we run this sketch, what we should see is one of the LEDs should be turning off as we progress through the numbers. So let's go here to sketch and say upload and I'll turn my camera back on and it on my host machine it's compiling and now it's uploaded you can see it the LEDs are turning off one by one as we cycle through them now I didn't show you hooking up all the little wires and putting the chip in the breadboard I mean this is not particularly complicated function on this chip but um, it was a good way to kind of just demonstrate what's going on with Arduino as we interact with some custom circuitry. Now, let's turn this back off. When you go out into the makerspace and you start looking around for sensors that are going to suit your needs and actuators that are going to suit your needs, you will most likely find that there are Arduino libraries already available for the sensors and actuators that you want to use. <coughs> now, if that were not the case, suppose you had a sensor and it has some digital inputs but it doesn't have an Arduino library available, you would just do the same thing that I've done in this little code snippet. You would associate the appropriate pin in the digital output section with uh, the outputs that you need to drive your sensor or the inputs that you need to read from your sensor. And instead of calling you know, some canned library function, you're just doing direct bit manipulation uh, by calling either digital write to send a value out or digital read to read a value in off of one of the digital pins. Um, if it's an analog output that you need to generate, then you would use pulse width modulation on one of the digital pins to generate an appropriate uh, analog voltage once that changing signal is smoothed out. If you are talking to an I squared C sensor or an SPI sensor, or actuator and there isn't already a library available for it, it's not too difficult to talk over SPI or I squared C directly to a piece of hardware. <coughs>
it, it's a little more work, but it, it's definitely doable. Um, okay, so we've talked about how embedded development is different from regular desktop development. Uh, we talked a little bit about what's in the 18 mega 328 microcontroller. The details are all in that 700 page data sheet if you really want to drill down that far. Um, we've talked about how we can use the, RD, the Arduino IDE to program the UNO. Um, we talked briefly about what's under the covers. As I mentioned, it's an implementation of GCC. And when you install the Arduino IDE, you can drill down through the file system of what was installed and you can see the executable for GCC and there's going to be a an assembler and a linker and a compiler it is a full C++ compiler I am not sure which version the, of C++ standard they're currently supporting um, they try to keep the compiler up to date with respect to releases from GCC because really they, they're not applying custom patches to GCC there there is a well-known um, in the in the GCC mainline code it already has code that targets the 18 mega 328 backend instruction set uh, and also the other 18 mega uh, microcontroller instruction sets and also you know the Raspberry Pi Pico and so on so it already targets those instruction sets directly in mainline GCC. That's not something that has to come from the Arduino people. What the Arduino people uh, provide you is the canned code that represents the bootstrap uh, in assembly language that gets the board started from reset and transfers control into main. They supply that implementation of main in their little library that calls the setup function once and then repeatedly calls the loop function. I think, I believe it also since obviously in my loop, as we saw, I, I let's go back here. I didn't need to reset the watchdog timer, but clearly, I mean my code is still running. So clearly the watchdog timer is being reset or it's turned off. It's possible that it's just turned off. I haven't looked at the details of the Arduino implementation to see how they handle the watchdog timer, but they're handling it somehow. So let's get back over here. Um, under the covers, the IDE, it's just a thing that takes your source file, puts some extra code around it, sends it to GCC. GCC compiles that into a binary file. The binary file is then converted into a format that's understood by the bootloader on the hardware board so it's then communicated to the bootloader by uploading it over the USB serial port the bootloader then takes this code and interprets that as a series of bytes to write into memory in order to get the program loaded and then uh, there's an instruction in the bootloader that says transfer control to the newly uploaded code and then off it goes so what made the Arduino very popular was the fact that it took all these little details that are if you had to do this from scratch it would be discouraging if you were an artist you wouldn't want to learn this much because you just want to get on with your project it's you know it's like imagine if every time you wrote an application in C++ the first thing you had to do was write a C++ compiler the end result would be like nobody would write C++ so what made the Arduino IDE popular was that they lowered the barrier to entry for uh, ordinary people to be able to write uh, a little microcontrolled system by giving them a nice IDE they hid the details of the tool chain in such a way that you didn't most of the time you don't need to worry about it all of the onboard facilities that are in the microcontroller are provided by access to libraries that are simple to use that there's good documentation on those libraries so looking up how to do something is very easy the hardware design itself was open source and provided extension through those headers and the idea of shields and all of that came along at just the right time so that a huge community formed around Arduino and many people have tried to create a competing single board computer that was supposedly going to kill the Arduino and they haven't to this day um, there are other 
single board competing platforms that are popular, which we will be looking at in the next two months. But Arduino is still going strong. Uh, the IDE that I'm showing here is uh, 1.8.16, which it doesn't have a date, but this is a fairly recent release. Uh, so they've continued to enhance the Arduino IDE. And because the Arduino IDE is so popular, uh, where is that? Um, because it's popular, ah, I can switch. So currently my board, my which is the setting for what single board computer I, computer I'm targeting, currently it's set to Arduino Uno. But as you see in here, I can go to an Arduino Leonardo or, <coughs> excuse me, I can, I can go to any of these other boards. And one thing that uh, has made Arduino very popular, not just for targeting, using the IDE to target an Arduino hardware board, is that it's, it's possible to find other see uh, I think there's support for the Pico okay Arduino embed OS RP 2040 boards this is the Raspberry Pi Pico so when I want to target another single board computer if that single board computer has been around for a while chances are I can just use the board manager in the Arduino IDE and get support directly for that board. This is the case for the boards that come out of Adafruit. The Adafruit has a popular series of boards that are called Feathers and the uh, attachment extension circuit boards instead of being called Shields and the Feathers that are called Feather Wings. Um, there's a, a variety of these little ecosystems of different single board computers and the uh, extension hardware that you can get for them. And being able to target all of that with a, a single IDE is very handy. Now, the IDE, you know, the, this isn't an embedded instance of Visual Studio or anything like that. So expect that although the editor and the syntax coloring are decent, it's not perfect. And the editor is not um, as full featured as like Visual Studio's editor, for instance, or any of those kind of fancy desktop IDEs. Uh, there is a third-party commercial product that lets you access the Arduino board manager and all of that functionality of, of the Arduino built-in libraries as an add-on to Visual Studio. Um, at first I thought that was an open source project but it's a it's a it's available for free but it is a commercial product. Um, there's also, I think, extensions for Visual Studio Code to let you access um, Arduino functionality from inside Visual Studio Code. I'm not 100% certain about that, but I believe I saw something about that. Um, so these are the things that made Arduino very popular. And I've only just kind of touched the surface here because we didn't go into a lot of detail about what's available on the microcontroller or what kind of shields are available or uh, the details of specific sensors or anything like that. But this should be enough to get you started and get going. Now, are there, I haven't seen anything in the chat or uh, any, any questions, so we can open that up for questions now if there are any, either in chat or by audio. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so we will end it there.